Wife went out partying without me even when I told her not to go. Later I found out she cheated. Unfortunately, I have stumbled upon this forum and I'm looking for some support, if you'd be so kind. A bit of background, I 30M, and my wife 25F. We've been married 3 years, and together for nearly 6 total. No children, no real assets whatsoever, more debt than there is cash in our checking, we rent a house, and I'm the primary breadwinner bringing home roughly 4k a month, and she nets around 1.5k, I work my crap off to provide her with the life she's accustomed to, and now facing the unthinkable. My work family is pretty tight-knit, a co-worker of nearly 3 years invited me to join in a recreational soccer league which I've played in for 2 years now. My wife would attend every soccer game of mine, which I thought was a show of support for me, but in the back of my mind, I thought she just went for the alcohol that went hand in hand with it. Most nights I had games, I would take it very light on the alcohol, but she as a spectator would get pretty loose during the games and ride home with me. Pretty frequently, after the games, a few of the guys and girls would get together at different places to hang out into the night. A few of the times, we all came back to my place, or we'd go to a bar, pizza joint, etc. Well, a couple of weeks ago, a group of them were going to get together at one of the guys' houses a city away from me. I told them all after the game that I apologized, we wouldn't be going, I had work early the next morning. Well, on the ride home, she texted one of the guys I considered as being a buddy, asking him to give her a ride over there. She asked me if it was okay for her to go while I was driving home, and I said no, I have work in the morning, and I want to be with you tonight. She gave me the angry alcoholic silent treatment, and upon arriving home, I pulled in the drive, and a car pulled up in front of the house. It was my buddy. She had made the executive decision to go to this party, and I was pissed. I went to my buddy's car and told him I'm not okay with this, and to leave, but then my wife got out of my car and into his. They drove away. In my rage, I plugged in the dead iPad I had bought for her some years earlier. It was old, but I knew it was connected to her messaging slash social media accounts. I saw exactly where she was, and tried staying up until I finally fell asleep that night around 3 AM, and she still wasn't home. When I woke the next morning, she was in our bed, I didn't know when she had came home. I got up, got ready for work, and left that morning without waking her, or kissing her goodbye, the first and only time that it ever happened. I wanted her to know I was pissed. Well, before I left for work, I grabbed the iPad and threw it in my briefcase. I got to work that day, and after a meeting and a few phone calls, I pull out the iPad, and see it light up with a notification from a messaging app, Buddy is typing. I open the app, and see a horrific exchange of messages that are supposed to self-destruct, but this app version must have been outdated, as I was able to witness in real time their conversation, recanting the night before, where Buddy is making references to them making love, and other guys that had fun last night. I damn near lost it, but then it got worse. I watch as my wife instructs Buddy to send her a video of him crapping off, which he obliged to do and I unfortunately witnessed. I ran out of my office and into the bathroom and vomited profusely. I was shaking from what I just witnessed, and got permission to leave work for the day. After taking several hours to chill the hell out, I was legitimately afraid I was going to hurt someone or myself, I drive home and find her still sleeping on the bed. I put my stuff down and ask her to come downstairs. I sat across from her, and asked her to tell me in detail everything that happened last night. Which she did, but omitted any sort of segil situations. Just drinking, playing pool, and talking, that was it. I then asked her when she spoke with Buddy last. She said she had messaged him back and forth a bit that morning, but nothing in particular. Then I dropped the bomb, would your story change if you knew I watched the entire conversation you had with him this morning? She blew up into tears, and first thing out of her mouth was are you leaving me? She came clean and told me that she couldn't really remember that clearly, but she had sex with Buddy and another teammate last night, and that's all she could remember, it may have been with more guys but she couldn't remember. I was disgusted. I asked her if this was the first time, and surprisingly she told me that there had been other times, one time was even in my house while I was sleeping upstairs. That was it. I was so numb to it all, I helped her pack a bag, and she left the house to go stay with family, and she pleaded for me not to tell anyone. I was alone in my horror story, and am now two weeks out from D-Day with no idea of what to do. I really hope I don't take the cake for worst D-Day experience, but it's hard to think of anything worse than catching your wife in a gangbang scenario with guys you've welcomed into your lives, and to find out that this has been going on for months with at least one of the guys. Now she wants to blame it all on alcohol and swear she's going to start AA. And wants to now go through couples therapy, she wants us to come out of this together. I think it's a little too late, but I'm a chump and I feel the full range of pit emotions including guilt, I don't know why. I have a meeting with an attorney tomorrow. I like to think I'm making the right move no matter how broken she is over being an alcoholic, and really wanting to work this out, I can't even talk to her without imaging her being the lunch meat in a douche sandwich. I can't trust her, I'm disgusted by her actions, repeated, I deserve a heck of a lot better than that, and I'm not perfect, but why in the hell do I feel so guilty? There's no reconciling this right? I'm not the bad guy am I? Any support slash words of wisdom are very much appreciated.
I feel like an idiot writing this all out and seeing it so clearly, but it's not easy to just stop caring about the person you were completely and fully blindsided by. Please take it easy on me. Update 1, I truly appreciate all of the advice, concern, and positivity that you all have sent my way. I realize that it's been almost a month since I posted about my experience, and I've had many people reach out to me kindly checking in, and wanting to know how I'm doing. Unfortunately, this situation has gone from horrific to unbelievably evil. There isn't a word I can think of that does it justice. I apologize in advance for what I know is going to be a long update post, but it's the only way to get the full picture of how truly destroyed I feel. Days after the initial post, I took your guys' advice and made a few appointments with attorneys, and one with a legal document preparation lady to keep my options open. My wife had no knowledge of those meetings FYI. We went a few days after the post with no contact directly, but she was adamant that this time she really was going to make an effort to get us to in to see a marriage therapist, which I had been insisting upon for months before my D-Day, so we can try to see if there was any way of working through this, but I knew in my heart what my choice would inevitably be. She did succeed in getting us onto a therapist schedule, but it was going to be about a week and a half until we could get in. During that time I was literally stalking her every move from that damned iPad. I was obsessing over it, watching every message come and go, checking Facebook, Snapchat, everything I possibly could. After a week and a half of scrutinizing every move she made digitally, I really had no further evidence, and I thought perhaps she was showing true remorse. When it finally came time to see the therapist, he sat us down, asked us why we were there and I told her to tell him the story in her own words. She left out some of the details, but most of it was there, out on the table. The therapist turns his head to me after hearing it all and asks me how does that make you feel about your trust in her? How does it make you feel about your marriage? I just shook my head in disbelief and shock, and instead of answering his question, I replied, if I don't say it out loud right now, I'm afraid I never will. There's no coming back from this for me, the marriage, this marriage is over. The vows were broken, my trust is shattered, and I think the only thing left to do is to get a divorce. My gut wrenched, and she completely blew up into hysterical crying. I continued, I don't know what can be salvaged from this relationship, but the marriage is over, I meant what I said on the altar, and I'm not being true to myself if I don't recognize this as being broken, unfixable. At that point, I felt a slight sense of relief, having stated it out loud, in front of her, and a neutral party, that I was done. The remainder of the therapist appointment was spent on him explaining to her why my feelings and my decision were completely rational given the situation, and calming her down. It actually couldn't have gone better in my opinion. He insisted upon seeing us not as a couple, but separately, to see if he could help us as individuals first, and maybe on the horizon, perhaps years from now, bring us together for discussion of reconciliation. I'll say it right now so you don't have to worry. At this point I don't have even the slightest intention of ever considering reconciliation, but at least in the meantime, the individual therapy might actually do me some good. Now, before I continue, I knew at this point I was about to embark upon a legal journey, which if not amicable, could be disgustingly ugly, and financially devastating to me, the breadwinner in a no-fault state. I've written all of this legal process out, but I'm omitting until things are locked in. Too risky to post online at the moment. The overarching point of the legal process is that I have to keep things amicable right now. Let's fast forward roughly a week and a half. By now, we've both had at least one individual therapy session each, and her narrative to her entire family is that we're ending the marriage because of the breaking of vows, but we're both trying to heal ourselves right now. She's still staying with family, and I continue my obsession with constantly searching her digital presence for any sign that she was continuing her disgusting habits as many of you had suggested she would. Not saying it's your fault, I would have been searching anyway. It wasn't until one night last week that I realized there was a place I hadn't checked ever checked, the App Store. I went to the app download history of the iCloud account, and saw that almost two weeks prior to that evening, she had downloaded a secret texting app onto her phone. My gut wrenched. I realized in one foul swoop that this entire time, she's gone out of her way to hide some sort of messaging from me, knowing I had her iPad, which she insisted upon me keeping so I can begin to trust her again, but I really think to this day that she didn't realize that an app downloaded on one iCloud device can be seen in the history from any iCloud connected device. I needed to know what the communications were within that app, I wasn't even in control of my body thinking back to those moments. I downloaded the app onto her iPad, tried a few of her most common login combos, and Viola. The truth. She not only had been messaging Buddy on this app since after our first therapy appointment together, but they had been continuing to have segs with one another, during times in which she knew I'd be out of the area. I puked. I cried. It was 3 in the morning on a weeknight. I went into the restroom and started grabbing all the prescription strength medications I could find. I went back into my room, with an overflowing handful of assorted pills that without a doubt would have been effective in ending my life. I sat on the edge of my bed, sobbing, ready to end it. I picked up my phone, and tried to call my mom. No answer. My dad. No answer. My sister. She answered. I told her what I had just discovered, through violent outbursts of tears, and she could tell I was on the verge of losing it. 
She didn't know I had the pills in my hand, but she did insist keeping me on the phone, albeit, in the middle of the night, until I had calmed down. It took about an hour but I was finally numb again and after hanging up the phone, I went back into the bathroom and poured the pills back into one of the bottles, washed my hands, then returned to bed to try to get at least a couple of hours of sleep that never came. As hours passed, I realized that I needed to go to work. I couldn't stand to be in that house, or that moment any longer. As I got dressed, I threw the bottle of pills into my briefcase along with the iPad, both of which, upon arrival to my office, I promptly gave to my most trusted co-worker and asked him to lock up in his desk and not return them to me no matter what, no questions asked. He obliged, and gave me a understanding pat on the shoulder as I walked away. So now I've done it. I got what I was asking for, what I had been searching for, undeniable proof that not only is my wife a cheater, but she's also a cold-blooded liar. I struggled for days on end, trying to decide what to do with the information I had discovered. On one hand, I wanted so badly to call her out to every possible family member, friend, or acquaintance and let the whole world know what she truly is, what she had done and was continuing to do, but I couldn't. I already have the process underway for ending the marriage, but there's still a time window where she could choose to get nasty, and costly. As days went by, and more and more texts, calls, and attempts to communicate with me went unanswered, she finally went out of her way to stop by and check on me. I about lost my crap. During the encounter, I was purposefully very vague and seemingly indifferent to her, I didn't know exactly what to do. It wasn't until she lost her temper and started yelling at me for acting weird that I gave her a chance and asked her point blank, have you had any contact with Buddy whatsoever since that night, her response? No. I blocked him on everything. I asked again, are you sure about that? She adamantly proclaimed that she hadn't, and that he was gross and she would never do that to me, she could never do that to me. Then I dropped the bomb. So what about this app, and what about this video I took on my phone of that app, showing the conversations you two have been having this whole time, the pictures you've sent one another, the plans you've made to sneak around based on my daily schedule. She collapsed onto the ground, sobbing, crying, begging me, for what I don't know. I kept my tone indifferent, so here's what's going to happen, I'm not going to tell anyone about this, and in exchange, you're not going to fight me at all about anything in the divorce process. I'm going to be fair, even though I shouldn't have to be, but you're going to be served with the divorce papers, and then do nothing with them, otherwise people will have to know about this situation and why it is that I'm being so unreasonable. Your choice. She left, and two days later, she was served. Since that day, I've kept my word, and haven't told anyone outside of my immediate family members, but I know for a fact, find my iPhone, she has visited him every single night since then, at the house where he lives with his mother. Her family thinks she's going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings every single night, but my screenshots of her location during the meetings prove otherwise. Seriously, why the F hasn't she changed her iCloud PW? I don't know why I keep compiling the evidence, but I do. I struggle right now with the anxiety of waiting for this period of time to pass until her right to fight me in court has passed, all the while, knowing her family thinks she's on the right path when they couldn't be further from the truth, in fact, she's lying to every single one of them. What hurts me the most right now is the injustice of it all. She gets to be around people, her family, and act like everything is on the up and up every day, and run off each night to have sex with him then sneak home in the middle of the night to keep up appearances, all the while, I go to work each day, head home to an empty, mentally haunting house, and experience how it truly feels to be alone in every sense of the word. I'm past the feelings of ever considering self-harm, but these are dark days nonetheless. I'm taking everything hour by hour, day by day until the day comes that I have the reassurance of knowing I too make it out of this hell without my finances being destroyed, and officially able to completely leave her in the dust. What I'll do from there, I truly do not yet know. I'm just trying to survive until that moment comes. Thank you all for reading, and for your concern, advice, wisdom, and the courage you've given me. My one outlet in a time of nothing but feeling completely shut out by the world. I may not know a single thing about you, but I trust you more than I trust my wife without a shadow of a doubt. Thank you. Update 2, this is my third post here, and hopefully my last. The incredible amount of support I received and the advice that was given to me here helped get me through the darkest days of my life. I've waited until now to chime back in, because at long last, my divorce is official, no more need to hide out after waiting the absurdly long 6 months and 1 day cooling off period to see if my ex-wife lawyered up without me knowing. It's done, I've gone completely no contact, and I feel like I'm finally able to start progressing forward in my life. A lot of folks followed my two initial posts right after D-Day, as insane and grotesque as they were, and I should have known that the rest of the cooling off period would be just as crazy, so I thought I'd share an update as to what has transpired since my last post. The last post I shared was 6 weeks after D-Day, and what I didn't say in that post was that I had already filed my papers with the county to start the divorce process. I followed the advice of many of the kind Redditors who suggested that I give her back the iPad, and sever any ties to devices slash accounts that would allow me to obsess over what slash where slash who she was doing. I knew enough. I knew what I wanted, out. 
My approach to the divorce process may have hurt me more emotionally in the long run, but didn't hit my pocketbook with nearly as much long-term impact, and it all seemed to make sense in real time as this transpired at an agonizing snail's pace. After coming to terms that this woman could never be trusted again in my life, I knew that I had to be rid of her, but I wasn't going to pay her month over month for half the length of the marriage to the tune of roughly $2,000 per month in spousal support, we didn't even have children together for crying out loud, as my state would have had me do as it's a no-fault divorce state, and I was the breadwinning spouse. No way, no how I'm paying her assent for what she has done to me. So I got angry, gave it some though, and devised a plan to get out of this marriage and away from her as quickly and fully as possible. Looking back, I am not proud of the tactics I used to navigate my divorce, but it worked out in the end, but I do feel my integrity, or moral high ground may have taken a hit. A matter of opinion I suppose. From my point of view of fault and responsibility, my actions were molehills compared to the mountains of mistrust, hurt, and anguish she caused me. Around the same time as my last post, I already had the divorce papers prepared and submitted to the county, but was awaiting their confirmation. I kept this from my wife, who was still living with her family, she never was welcome to stay in my home ever since I first made her leave, I had arranged a few times for us to meet up and talk. I wanted to convince her that somehow, some way, I still wanted to try to find a way to salvage the relationship, complete lie, but in all of our discussions I made it clear that in my mind, our marriage, this marriage was over, the vows had been broken, and if we truly wanted to start again we would need to start fresh. We would need to mutually end this marriage, and then begin dating one another again, courting, and finding our way into a new, stronger relationship, I'm literally about to gag typing all of this out, I still can't believe she bought this. In fact, I was going to go out of my way to make it as easy and painless as possible for her, hurry the process along, and keep it out of the public eye to just get through this phase, so we can focus on the next together. A prime example of this was how I had her served. We had a mutual friend come over to my house, the house we had lived in together, and play third wheel in a handoff, signature exchange, and conversation. She signed the papers she needed to, sealed up her documents in the envelope they came in without even scanning through them. I doubt she ever really did dig into the minutiae of those tedious legal forms, because I painted myself a very pretty picture, completely absent of any spousal support beyond splitting what was in our account at the time. This was the single largest issue that I wanted to avoid running into, paying her spousal support. Over the first few months, I tried to ride out the need time on my own to think card pretty hard to avoid seeing her, but met with her roughly two times a month to have dinner or meet up in a public place to make small talk and act like I gave a crap. These meetings were always a public place so she would never be able to say I tried to do something to her. I kept up appearances. I played her on. I made her feel like I was truly working through my emotions and coming to grips with what happened, and seeking the ability to forgive so we could reconcile, when I had absolutely no intentions of doing so. By keeping her let on, I was able to cleanly remove her from my bank accounts, with her actual assistance in doing so, having her removed from the lease, and even got all of her possessions moved out of our house into a storage unit, because after this was all said and done, I convinced her that we would get a new place together, and having her stuff out of the house would make the house feel a lot less haunting to me as I heal. Lying to her and keeping her in this state of submission and cooperation made all of the difficult separation tasks insanely easy, and she thought she was doing the right thing for us. This strategy got me through about four of the six months I needed to get through until I reached the light at the end of the tunnel. It wasn't until some time in early month four that I received a text message from a family member she was living with, asking if we were still working things out. This family member knew of Buddy and the truth to the story, but to keep up my reconciliation charade, I replied with a yes, why? And I received back a picture of my wife and Buddy having dinner at a restaurant a city away, with a follow-up text saying this is happening right now. Just so happens that this family member was meeting up with co-workers for drinks after work, and spotted them together. This is where I completely messed up by letting my emotions get to me. I texted my wife right then, and asked if she could talk on the phone, and she replied back with a lie that she was in an AA meeting, and that she could call me as soon as she was out. That's when I lashed back with I didn't know that they held AA meetings at, and that buddy was now your sponsor that got her attention. She called me immediately, and started yelling again, accusing me of stalking her, I replied with some choice words the mods definitely won't allow on this sub, basically telling her off, calling her some names, and acknowledging to her that I have absolutely no interest in speaking with her ever again. Thus, the last two months of the divorce resulted in her being in a relationship with Buddy, which was private at first, but eventually became public. I had blocked both of them on all social media, but through various friends of ours, information trickled in, questions arose, and more and more people started contacting me wanting to know what was going on. Apparently, my wife was getting bolder and posting status updates and pictures of the two together. If someone reached out to me and asked, I would tell them as much as they wanted to know. The friendships and relationships I truly valued and wanted to salvage, I had to get on my side. It didn't take more than telling them the truth to do the trick, but having the support behind me, and to hear people who knew us both acknowledge that what she did to me was horrific, just to hear that validation felt more important than the material division in the divorce itself in those moments. I finally had people to vent to, 
and boy did I vent. Almost everyone I spoke with about what happened, had communicated with her first in one way or another to find out who is this guy she was posting all these pictures of. A common denominator arose from each of those follow-up calls to me, that she drastically downplayed the events which had occurred, though to the best of my knowledge she didn't deny that she was the one who cheated, I was more than obliged to fill them in on the details she chose to leave out. Every one of our friends, and most of her closest relatives were in shock, and I truly believe chose, and continue to choose, to support me, and I found myself asking them not to rock the boat until the divorce was finalized. The more time that went by where they were together, the bolder the pictures became, the more public they went with their relationship, the more my phone rang. It came to the point that I had to ask people to please stop informing me of their developments because it still was causing real emotional pain. Valentine's Day happened to be just a few days before the finalization of the divorce, and along with the day of love came three screenshots from three different people all of the same social media post, the two pigs embraced, along with a romantic description to go along with a picture about how amazing God is to deliver such a wonderful man into her life, and that she couldn't be happier, and that she, literally, hopes he is a man she'll marry someday. Whenever a door shuts, God opens a window. I did get a kick out of the confused comments from extended family, and her far removed friends asking who that was, even a few of the shocked emoji faces. I would like to say it doesn't bother me, them being together, but it does deep down. I still feel a deep sense of loss, but now, I also feel an absolute feeling of pure disgust and regret at how ridiculous, grotesque, and cold-hearted this woman is, and I feel a sickness within me for feeling like I wasn't able to see this monster right in front of me for so many years. Not to mention what a despicable human being Buddy is. I truly have no respect or energy to comment or worry about him. He's sure to get hit by the karma train sticking around with her, my ex-wife, someone I truly feel like I do not know anymore, and it's making it a bit easier on me moving forward. Alas, the day finally came last week, where the court-appointed date of the dissolution of our marriage arrived. I hadn't been served any papers, and her opportunity had passed to fight me for anything we hadn't listed on the agreements last drafted when we were still going to try again. I was able to keep my entire 401k, no spousal support, no additional debt into my name, no lawyers, no court, no having to ever deal with this person ever again. At the end of that day, I blocked her number from my cell phone. The next day, seven of my closest friends, six of which were friends of the both of us, threw me a divorce party which they posted on Snapchat throughout the night. It was truly a celebration worth documenting, and earned every single one of them a complete social media block from my ex-wife, and a few nasty texts to some of them. Her maid of honor was at my divorce party, and wants nothing to do with her ever again. P.S. There is one final internal struggle I'm having, maybe someone can offer some insight. Back during the D-Day obsession period, when I was scouring her digital footprints, I stumbled upon the fact that she had been sleeping with a man from her hometown while all of this was going on. The thing is, this guy is an old flame of hers, but has a wife and a kid at home, and I truly struggle with whether or not I need to find a way to make sure the wife knows. I feel ashamed I haven't said anything to this point, but the thought of destroying a family, and having that on my conscience is something that I have not yet been able to rationalize. Do I find a way to tell her? Do I identify myself? Do I keep this to myself? This situation is a worm in my head that is persistent, and literally making me nauseous, anxious, and having nightmares on occasion. Any advice would be appreciated, all things considered. Update 3, hello again everyone. In 17 days, it will be the second anniversary of my D-Day. Honestly, when I go back and read the previous posts I wrote, I can honestly say I never thought I'd make it this far, in terms of the amount of time that has gone by, and the healing of the pain, burden, hurt, and depression I felt because of my ex-wife's horrific actions. I've received messages from many of you caring folks asking for an update, and all I can say is be careful what you ask for. Hopefully this will be my final update as to what has taken place since the divorce became official. In case you're joining the conversation at this point, here's a bit of light reading that will get you caught up on the situation. If you enjoy being stunned, flabbergasted, appalled, or left saying unbelievable, read the posts below first before continuing on. Obviously it has been quite a while since my last update, but there have been some important events that transpired that truly show how appalling a human being can be. After the divorce was finalized in February 2019, I tried my best to go no contact, but that's easier said than done nowadays. I didn't speak to her or anything like that, but every now and then I might see a post from a distant family member of hers that I hadn't yet blocked, or a friend would unintentionally mention something they saw on a mutual friend's Snapchat, things along those lines. All of my true friends tried their best to keep these types of updates to themselves, but some news was too big to hold back. The first blockbuster came in May of 2019, when one of my best friends called me to tell me that my ex-wife was getting remarried to a guy from Tennessee. Wait. What? Yeah, it was true. My friend's husband had yet to block my ex-wife on Facebook, and was able to take screenshots of the events that transpired leading up to the big news. Mind you, this all took place between March of 2019, and July of 2019. Apparently, Buddy and her didn't last too long after the divorce was finalized. 
I don't know the specifics about that or how it ended. I kind of wish I did, but not surprising in the least. Starting in April, a string of status updates on Facebook alluded to everything happening for a reason and subversive hints that she was falling in love with someone. Poor soul. Then seemingly out of nowhere in July, a simple picture and caption posted on her wall, the picture was of her and some random dude, none of have knew or had heard of, standing in a courthouse, holding hands, rings on fingers, holding up what must have been a marriage certificate. Geo tagged in California, proudly updated with her new last name, with a caption saying something along the lines of excited to start the rest of my life with such an amazing man. Feeling so blessed. Look out Tennessee, here we come. Dramatic, stupefied pause, I know that this entire story all the way back to my first post may seem unbelievable, but I can offer you no other proof than to say I'm writing down the God's honest truth. These next few lines may lose some of you, but I hope if you've read this long, you have some trust in me. I felt I needed to warn you before going on. I simply could not stand the intense curiosity of the situation. I reached out to one of my ex-wife's cousin-in-laws who I got along with pretty well to get the rest of the story. He obliged. Her new husband was someone who she had met online, and had been talking to for a few months over the phone, text, etc. Apparently they both fell hard and fast for one another and he proposed to her on a phone call. She said yes, and they simply couldn't wait. Within a week of the proposal, and a serious attempt by her to inform her family and invite them to attend the wedding, which took place in a very random town about two hours away from our hometown for some reason I don't know. He flew out to California, and the marriage took place on a Saturday. That day also turned out to be the first time that they had met face to face, but they were now man and wife. The kicker, according to the cousin, is that not one person from her family attended the courthouse wedding. Whether that was due to the lack of time to plan, or lack of respect to attend, they were married unceremoniously, something I'm sure would have bothered the heck out of her. That Sunday was spent packing a moving truck with all of her belongings, and they set east for Tennessee on Monday. I couldn't believe it. I've heard it from enough people by now to know that the story and timeline is true, but it was simply unbelievable at the time. That poor man. If only he knew. I'm sure if he did know, he would have had the presence of mind to not get married in California, a no-fault state, where he could fall into the same situation I was facing with her, but hopefully he was simply not informed as opposed to being that stupid. For the time being, I did the best I could to shake the idea of both of them from my mind, but I did find solace in knowing that they were moving far, far away where I know I wouldn't have any chance of randomly running into her ever again. Summer came and went in 2019, but right in the middle of fall, another bombshell. While thumbing through Instagram, a video crept up on my screen of my ex-wife holding a plate in front of her father, him covering his eyes with his hands. Before I was able to realize what it was that I was looking at, I saw that on the plate sat a single cookie, covered with blue frosting. My ex-wife's voice came through and was counting down, 3. 1. It's a boy. As her father uncovered his eyes. It was a freaking gender reveal video? Why am I seeing this? Her mother had just created an Instagram account, completely public, and posted this video of her husband's excitement. Apparently Instagram's algorithm thought I'd like to see this video from someone I may know. I completely lost it. That was actually a really bad set of days, and sleepless nights. The sickened feeling I had was a mix of disgust, pain, frustration, and even a bit of jealousy. It's one of my great aspirations in life to become a father, and had all of this not happened, on our previous timeline, this very well could have been the time that we had a child together, it could have been my child. I could have been the one becoming a father. I'm 32 years old now, I thought I'd be one by now much less, not even on a path towards having a relationship, let alone a child. I'm a mature man, and I realize that I do have time ahead of me to achieve the dream with someone I love and am happy with, but I can't stop myself from comparing where I'm in life to where I thought I'd be by now. All I can say for certain is that in this particular scenario, I'd very much rather be in my position, than the soon-to-be fathers. I imagine that by now, the baby is probably born. I've had the good fortune, and good company of those around me to not have heard either way. I know this is the preferable position to be in, not knowing, than the alternative, but I can't help but wonder every now and then. The good news is that when I really think about it, there are more and more days now that she and her dumpster fire of a life, do not cross my mind whatsoever, and I consider that progress. There still are bad days, which are made exponentially worse because of the stay-at-home orders, creating unbearably depressing days. I have the good fortune of currently working as an independent contractor, able to work from home on my computer, but those are very lonely days. I make a point to get out and walk but I do miss the gym. I've gone home to visit my parents as much as I can, just to have some company that isn't talking to someone on a webinar, or over the phone. I know this situation we all find ourselves in, is a shared in its effects on all of our lives. It's not something I'm going through alone. When I get to feeling hopeless, I think back to the early days following my D-Day, and how I thought I'd never make it through that, yet I have, and I'll make it through this difficult time as well. One day at a time, one moment to the next if need be, but time moves forward, no matter how slowly it seems to be moving. I thank you all for taking the time to read my update and catch up on what's transpired. 
I'd like to close by offering my sincerest gratitude for those of you who commented, messaged me, and encouraged me through this entire life event. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that it was the strength of this community that saved me, encouraged me, and gave me another shot at living a happy life after avoiding a dismal existence. Thank you. Here's to another two years of surviving and thriving. Update 4, so it's been three years now since D-Day, and more than a year since my last post. This last year has been the first where I've been able to finally focus on me. I don't have an update on my ex-wife or her situation, as I have gone completely no contact from her entire family on all forms of communication. I've even had to mute slash block mutual friends of ours where unwanted information may have been able to slip through. I knew from my past experiences, that keeping anything that had to do with her or her family off my feed was going to give me the best chance to focus on my life moving forward, not letting my mind get lost in the past. Honestly, going no contact with her family was extremely difficult, because they were my family, up until she chose to do what she did. I loved some of them as I would blood relatives, and coming to terms with losing those relationships was hard and unfair, but ultimately necessary. I know this strategy is working for me, and benefiting me, because as time goes on, there are far more days where I don't think about her at all versus when I do. Even if I do think about her now, it's more of a thank god I dodged the crap storm than anything to do with sorrow or pain. This last year, during the pandemic, I made a drastic change in my career, and started my own independent consulting business in tech support slash IT system design. It was a leap of faith that was quickly rewarded, landing a few contracts relatively quickly including two government organizations here in the county where I reside. It's been a heck of a lot of work, but both contracts have been renewed for another 12 months, with no signs of slowing down. Working for myself and having the freedom to make such a decision, with no one dependent on my success except for myself, has been invigorating, and I take so much pride in the work I'm able to deliver to my clients. Having that feeling of self-worth has made a huge difference in how I view the past, and not so feeling worried about the present or future. My work life is solid, my finances are far better than they've ever been, my mind is mostly free from the memories that haunted me, my body is in better shape than it has been since this whole thing started, and I'm feeling good about myself as a man. The one area I'm a bit concerned with has to do with my general lack of trust in people, but especially women in a romantic sense. My lack of trust in people made leaving my job easy, and going into business for myself a no-brainer. I don't have to count on anyone but myself to get the job done, and the job always gets done. But romantically? The urge to be with someone has faded drastically. I'm fine being alone, and in my brief exploration into online dating, I realized that for the most part, it's nothing but a cesspool of broken people. I came to this conclusion after three to four dates that turned out to be extremely underwhelming experiences with women who weren't really looking for something of substance, as their profiles would have had you believe, but rather, attention-deprived women who wanted the undivided attention of men they were speaking slash meeting with. I don't believe a single one of those dates I went on about a year ago were only talking to me at the time, which made me feel like I was condoning their playing the field. I've had enough of that for one lifetime. I don't mean to sound like I'm disrespectful of any woman, or that I've taken a pill or I'm going my own way. There's a huge part of me that yearns for that connection and intimacy, and I desire to share my life with someone. However, just because I feel that way doesn't mean that I'm going to let just anyone into my life for the sake of not being alone. I'm willing to be patient, do the work I need to do to continue putting my life on its best course, and keep my eyes, ears, and heart open to the idea that I can love again someday. I have this annoying self-dialogue that pops into my head more than I'd like to admit, that keeps reminding me that I'm 34 years old, and I should have had a wife and kids by now, and be living a happy life like all my other friends, who are paying mortgages, going on trips, doting over their children and living their best lives seemingly. What do I have? Money in the bank? Does that make you feel better about your life? This is something I obviously need to continue working on, but I know that holding myself to some theoretical timeline in my head isn't what I need in reality. For now, I'm grateful to have the life I'm leading, I'm blessed beyond belief to not be living a different version of my life with my ex-wife still being tied to me, and I'm hopeful that if I continue putting myself first, and making the most of my days, that no matter what happens, I'll be able to look back and say that I'm proud of who I am, and that I made the most out of being dealt a pretty bad hand to start with. What are your thoughts on OP? Thank you for joining us in our tales where revenge is served piping hot. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more stories that guarantee your satisfaction. Stay tuned for the next one to satisfy your appetite for revenge. If you're under 18, brace yourself. It's not for the faint-hearted.